Whenever I give a Dharma talk, I always have the dilemma of how do we talk about Zen? In, in this case, I thought to myself, what would Zen Master Dogen, the founder of the Soto School, do? And the answer most often for him was to talk about a koan. So first, what's a koan? You've probably heard of them before, even if you're not aware of it. What's the sound of one hand clapping? That's probably the most famous one. But there's also, does a dog have the Buddha nature? These koans are typically stories of Zen students and Zen teachers acting very oddly together, almost paradoxically. But I'd like to show you that in at least one case that there isn't a paradox there, but instead a call to live life to its fullest. The koan we're going to talk about is Guo Xi's Three Calls. You'll also sometimes see it as the National Teacher's Three Calls. It's case 17 from the Gateless Barrier, or the Mumon Khan, which is a collection of koans that was put together in 1228 CE, so pretty old. And I feel that, in particular, this koan really captures the essence of what it is we're trying to do in Soto Zen. So first, the koan is, as written is a bit of an abbreviation of a fuller account, although even the fuller account is a bit abbreviated, so I've added in some extra elements to flesh it out a bit. So I'll read it, and then we'll go over it more carefully. So it goes. One day, Boshi called to his attendant, Don Yuan. In response to the call, the attendant came running and answered, Yes, master. Ah, never mind. And Don Yuan went back to what he'd been doing. A little while later, the master called again. Don Yuan! And Don Yuan came running and said, Yes, master. Ah, never mind. And Don Yuan went back to his quarters. And then the master called him a third time. Don Yuan! And the attendant came running and answered, Yes, master. It was then that the, that the master remarked, I was about to say that I was ungrateful to you, but the fact is that you are ungrateful to me. That's it. Pretty simple, right? <laughs> when I first read this koan, I thought to myself, what the heck is even happening here? I couldn't make heads or tails of it. One tricky thing with koans is that they're very removed from us historically and culturally, and really they're, they're not meant to stand on their own. Once you've read a koan, you have to go out and discover the backstory, find out who the protagonists are, what their relationships were, just a lot of background before what the koan is trying to do will become clear for you. So to fill in some of that background, this koan takes place in China around the mid-700 CE, Guo Xi was the student of one of the most famous and important Zen masters of all time, the sixth patriarch Hui Nung, the same Hui Nung of the Platform Sutra, which is one of Zen's foundational texts. Besides Zen's original founder, Bodhidharma, who came from the West to save all sentient beings, Hui Nung is considered Zen's second founder, the person who first equated meditation with wisdom or prajna. The person who Guo Xi is talking to is Dan Yuan. Dan Yuan is Guo Xi's attendant. Now, this is a very important position for a young monk. It meant that you were at the Zen master's side throughout the day. You were also at his beck and call, as we see from the koan, but this also meant that you got to see the day-to-day -day practice of Zen as expressed through the master's life, as he lived it from moment to moment. And that's not an opportunity to waste. And as we'll soon see, Don Yuan didn't waste his chance. But back to the koan. The key I found, so to speak, to unlocking a koan is not to try to figure it out. They're designed to break your brain because they're pointing to a mode of being, a uh, activity of life that isn't dependent on words or concepts. These old Chinese practitioners were really dedicated to not conceptualizing. They were trying to directly point to all of this to just get back to right here and right now. So after having said that, <laughs> after just having said that these practitioners were trying to point to something beyond words and conceptions, let, let me give you a phrase that sums up what Don Yuan was doing. 
and the phrase is beginner's mind. Now, beginner's mind has a long history in Zen, but you, you might be most familiar with it from the book Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. It's a compilation of Dharma talks given by Shunryu Suzuki, who was a Japanese Soto Zen monk and teacher who founded the San Francisco Zen Center and just generally helped spread Zen in the West. And beginner's mind was one of the concepts that he really stressed. So what does it mean, beginner's mind? It's a way to talk about that state of mind where you don't have enough information about a topic to really have an opinion about it at all, where there's really nothing but wonder and curiosity. Like before you learned to drive when you were just sitting in driver's ed class, imagining what it would be like to be behind the wheel, or before you met your partner's family, who are these people that made this person that I love? Who could they possibly be? Shinryu was pointing towards a more honest, open way of interacting with the world, a type of interaction without preconceived notions. It's the type of mind where instead of saying, oh yeah, I, I know exactly the type of person you are, you, you say, I have no idea what type of person you are, but I want to know. Now, you might stop me here and be like, am I really supposed to just let someone treat me like Woshi treated Don Yuan? It can certainly look like Guo Xi is bullying Don Yuan, but it's good to remember that these types of relationships, student-teacher relationships, student-student relationships, what have you, should be built on mutual trust and respect. As crazy as some of these koan stories can get with their slaps and their kicks and any number of questionable occurrences, the truest realization of Buddhist training occurs when all the parties involved have earned and displayed trust. We take vows to be of benefit to all beings, and that should be remembered, especially in situations like this koan. So all of that being said, let's get back to our koan and take another closer look. Guo Xi, the master, calls his attendant Dan Yuan three times. Each of these times Dan Yuan replies pleasantly, seemingly undisturbed by Guo Xi's odd behavior. Similar to most koans, there's a give and take and interplay between the participants. Here specifically to understand what's happening, we need to take a look at what Don Yuan's doing. And what is that? As we just talked about, he's practicing beginner's mind. And not just any beginner's mind, but radical, dedicated beginner's mind. He stripped his mind of any preconceived notions and is just meeting Guo Xi's requests at absolute face value. If it had been me, by the third time he'd called, I'd have been like, why are you messing with me? Because I'd be bringing all my baggage along with me. I'd be thinking, he must have some sort of ulterior motive? Or is he testing me? Is he, is he being a bully? Is he crazy? Am I crazy? Do I even want to keep hanging out with a guy who would treat me this way? The types of questions and reactions that you'll have will be born from your own particular life experiences. If you had a rough relationship with your mother or father, say, then the same types of thoughts and emotions that would appear during those confrontations tend to appear in other types of situations, like the ones where you're facing your own personal Guo Xi. Instead of facing Guo Xi as Guo Xi, you'll find yourself facing the memory of a scolding or distant parent. Or if you have a boss who's particularly nasty, you might find your boss's face covering up Guo Xi's like a mask. And then all the related emotions and ideas and behaviors will just spring right up out of that. Beginner's mind, however, is simply seeing Guo Xi as Guo Xi. Seeing your mother and father as your mother and father, your boss as your boss, yourself as yourself. We often find ourselves spending our days arguing with the ghosts of people who aren't even there, who we carry around inside of ourselves and fight against or long for or just lament. When Dan Yuan says, Yes, Master. He's left all of his preconceived notions behind and is just looking at each of Guo Xi's requests simply as requests. He's, he's not thinking about the other requests that came before or the possible requests coming down the line. He's just facing what's right in front of him as what's right in front of him. That's it. So, with that being said, let's take a look at Guo Xi's final lines again. They read, then the master remarked, I was about to say that I was ungrateful to you, but the fact is that you are ungrateful to me. There are a couple translations of these lines that I found. Uh, another interesting one is, 
I thought that I had transgressed against you, but you too had transgressed against me. So why would Guo Xi think that he was being ungrateful to Dan Yuan or that he transgressed against him? I think this is acknowledging a natural response to beginner's mind that sometimes we do need our preconceived notions to keep us safe or to keep us and our relationships healthy. We don't want to blot them out entirely from our minds, but we simply want to understand what it is they are and why they are like they are. Guo Xi is telling Dan Yuan that those times he called him, Guo Xi himself hadn't been practicing beginner's mind, but that he'd had ulterior motives. He'd been testing the strength of Dan Yuan's beginner's mind, and so the reciprocity of their relationship at that moment had been broken. The same is true of Dan Yuan, but from the opposite perspective. Guo Xi called Dan Yuan three times in order to test him. He is ungrateful and he has transgressed against Guo Xi in the sense that Dan Yuan's proven that he doesn't need a teacher anymore because he's perfectly embodied the teachings. So in the true Zen fashion to have been transgressed against is a positive statement here. It's good to remember that Zen teachings aren't grand statements about the fundamental nature of reality, although you'll probably hear people talk about them that way, and Buddhists have been arguing about it for thousands of years. But the teachings are just a raft that we use to cross the river. Once we've crossed over, it's time to put the raft down. It may feel like we're being ungrateful to the raft, just leaving it there after it's, after it's been so essential for us, but, I mean, Sorry, Raft, I'm not going to keep dragging you around with me now that I'm up on dry land. That's just ridiculous. So, all this talk about beginner's mind is good, but how exactly are we supposed to cultivate it? How do we make it happen in our own lives? That's a good question because it ties in with the original question we had at the beginning of the talk, namely, how, how do we talk about Zen and Soto Zen in particular? As Zen practitioners, we're the Buddhists who meditate. Now, almost all Buddhists meditate, but Zen people, and Soto Zen people in particular, really meditate a lot. We can get a bit carried away with it. However, our method is very, very simple. We call it Zazen, which just means sitting meditation. And specifically, we call it Shikantaza, which means just sitting. And that's the method. We find a comfortable seat, or we lie down if we're unable to sit comfortably. We face a blank wall and sit. That's it. This is how we, as Soto Zen practitioners, develop beginner's mind. We face the wall and simply sit, just like how Don Yuan answered those three calls, with no preconceptions. This is the same process that Zen Master Dogen wrote about in his Fuk Fukan Zazengi, the Universal Recommendations for Seated Meditation. He writes, put aside the intellectual practice of investigating words and chasing phrases and learn to take the backward step that turns the light and shines it inward. Body and mind of themselves will drop away and your original face will manifest. If you want to realize such, get to work on such right now. Here Dogen is telling us to turn our light inward. In our simple sitting, the light of our mind will shine inward and outward, and illuminate the entire world of suchness. And what is this suchness? It's this very moment, right here and right now, as it is. This moment as this moment. It's Don Yuan facing those three calls with no preconceptions. It's us bringing the mind that we find in meditation up off of the cushion and out into the world, living peacefully and with acceptance. So in the Guo Xis of the world, and we can find our Guo Xis everywhere, that person who just cut us off in traffic, that guy who just said something rude to us in line, or the voice of relatives long gone that still haunt us. When our teachers call out to us over and over again, are we going to see the uniqueness, the unrepeatability, the suchness of those calls, of those situations of our lives? Through the power of beginner's mind, I know that we will. Thank you.